For many young soldiers, it was their first time away from home. They wrote postcards home with reports of life along the border. Dear Hattie, the bayonets are not shown on these guns, but they are sure wicked looking weapons. Think of having one of them run through your middle, Matt. Dear Mom, I laid down on a cactus the other day. You ought to have seen me jump, Jack. Dear Dad, Pancho Villa, the man we are after. President Carranza was assured by President Wilson that the only objective of the American expedition was to capture Pancho Villa. The written objective that came from, the, from Wilson to Pershing was to capture Villa and or break up his band so as to protect the border. Uh, what was the unwritten part, at least Pershing clearly understood what the objective was, and the objective was to kill Villa. On March 16th, the New York Times reported, when word was given to form for the pursuit of Villa, the cavalry, infantry, artillery, and the signal corps and the commissary dovetailed into a rapidly lengthening column. The punitive expedition was the last of the old and the first of the new. It's a fault line in American military history. This is where uh, the last great cavalry operation in the United States Army, this, this was it. This was the last who were out of the cavalry. The expedition also included new armored vehicles designed for mechanized warfare. Their outer plates were a quarter of an inch thick, and the vehicles weighed almost four tons. At the time of the raid, the U.S. had a total of 98 motor vehicles. And now in this expedition, they're going to get over 600 trucks, and they're going to feed and transport that operation, or a large part of it, by truck for the first time in the history of the United States Army. These cavalry types are going to, uh, to be trained in how, how to drive trucks. And they were saying, whoa, and it would, the truck wouldn't stop. There was only one outfit in the entire United States Army even knew how to drive. Airplanes, never before used in battle, were flown in from San Antonio. My dad took me out to see an airplane. I had never seen an airplane. And I was scared to death of that. I thought it would get me. These pilots were crazy. Pershing, when he sent them down, he told them to fly down at night. They had never flown at night in their lives. And they all saluted and said, yes, sir, <laughs> and went down. It's nothing short of a miracle that all these guys didn't die in plane crashes. There had been passenger ships on the North Atlantic since 1840, but in 1907, the Cunard Line introduced the Lusitania. The Lusitania was the lead ship. She was the one that set the standard. The Lusitania sailed from New York, bound for Liverpool, her home port, May 1st, 1915. She was carrying just over 2,200 people. There was a sense of foreboding when she left. The day before she sailed, there appeared a series of advertisements reminding these passengers that a German declared war zone existed around the British Isles. Any ship entering this war zone was liable to destruction without warning. 
On the 7th of May, she was approaching the south coast of Ireland. There was a heavy fog. It burned off by mid-morning, but Captain William Turner, her skipper, decided that he needed to know exactly where he was. He had received a series of messages in the previous 24 hours warning him of the activity of German U-boats at various points around Ireland. Around 1 o'clock, he decided to take what was known as a four-point bearing. It's a complicated procedure that requires the ship to steam on a straight-line course with no alteration of speed for about 45 minutes. What Turner didn't know was there was a German U-boat out there, the U-20, under the command of Captain Lieutenant Walter Schwieger. Schwieger was tracking the Lusitania, and when Turner altered his course to begin taking his four-point bearing, he turned right across Schwieger's bow. Schwieger ordered a single G-type torpedo fired at the Lusitania. At 2.10 p.m. on May 7, 1915, that torpedo struck the Lusitania. 18 minutes later, she was at the bottom. Those minutes began in confusion. They progressed into terror and ended in catastrophe. Half the lifeboats were unusable. There were a couple of uh, attempts to try and launch the boats there that ended in terrible failure. Remember, this ship is thundering forward at 18 knots. The, the speed is not off of her. She's going down. There are screams. There are cries. Uh, one of the most tragic incidents was in one of the nurseries where there were babies that were unattended that, that in, in pure terror were crying out. And their cries only ceased when the water came into the nursery and drowned the little ones. It was literally every man and woman for himself right from the start. Ultimately, 1,198 people died. Around the world, people were stunned by the audacity of the attack and by the sheer loss of life. There was a, a complicated set of protocols that were known as the cruiser rules, which set down the guidelines for how a warship should act when stopping and seizing or, if necessary, destroying an enemy civilian vessel. One of the strict provisions of the cruiser rules was that the warship should allow the civilians an opportunity to take to the lifeboats before any action against the ship itself was taken. Now, the German rationale for this unannounced attack was that the Lusitania was carrying a cargo of munitions, rifle ammunition and three-inch shrapnel shells. The thing is, the British didn't think the Germans would go so far as to attack passenger ships. So as early as the late fall of 1914, they began shipping cargoes of munitions, war materials, artillery on British passenger liners believing that the passengers, uh, the civilian men, women, and children aboard these ships would serve as a shield for these military cargoes. The German government finally deliberately blurred the line between civilians and combatants, between the soldier in uniform and the home front with everyone in civilian clothes. This began an erosion of the standards by which warfare would be conducted for the rest of the 20th century. It was an attitude that would first start to manifest itself in the Spanish Civil War in 1937 with the bombing of the city of Huernica with horrible loss of life. The city of Huernica had no military value, but the fear struck in the hearts of the civilians in the city was incredible. It was followed uh, three years later by the bombing of Rotterdam in May of 1940, by the London Blitz. There was no concept of precision bombing. This was area bombing. The same thing happened in the Pacific, the rape of Nanking. Fast forward this, if you will, to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's a process that began on May 7th, 1915. 
It was inevitable from the minute that Schwieger fired that torpedo. And the consequence was that war, as Winston Churchill put it, had ceased to be cruel and glorious and instead became cruel and sordid. Everyone thought the wars were going to be fought really short. They thought, and, and there, they had every reason to suppose this. The last two major wars fought in Europe was the Russo-Prussian War and over 40 years earlier, and just prior to that, a, a, a short war between Germany and Austria. These were fast wars in which there was a decisive outcome within a matter of months and, or weeks. So the idea that the war would be fast was entirely reasonable. I think if the national leaders had had any idea at the beginning of the war how long it was going to last and what it was going to cost, they would have done anything to keep out of it. When people think World War I, they have this vision of trench lines and men going over the top, both German and French, British, later Americans. Technology is, is vital in understanding uh, the way World War I was fought and particularly how it sort of came uh, to a standstill. And that is, uh, in World War I, uh, temporarily, the weapons of defense overshadowed the weapons of offense. And that's what got them trapped in the trench system. The Germans had expected to win in 42 days, but they had not anticipated what would happen on the Western Front in France. On the Western Front, the German assault had finally failed, and soldiers on both sides had raced to dig an elaborate trench system that stretched for 300 miles from the English Channel all the way to Switzerland. On New Year's Day in 1915, the young men who had gone off to fight glorious battles were now trapped in a desperate war of attrition. Someone said to us excitedly, Jack Smith. I said, what about him? He's dead. He's been shot. The first one of the battalion to be shot. I said, what? Yes, he's dead. He's been shot. He put his head too far over and a sniper got him. And that caused a bit of a sensation amongst the, the lads. They thought, well, uh, this is not exactly what we come for kind of business. But later on, from that day onwards, when we went to the trenches, it was three kill, four kill, five kill, 20 kill, a hundred kill. By then, we was veterans. A young American poet, Alan Seeger, was among those looking for adventure when he joined the Foreign Legion to fight for France. His diary reveals how seldom he found it. It's a miserable life, shivering in these wretched holes in the dirt. We're not leading the life of men at all, but that of animals, living in our holes in the ground, and only showing our heads outside to fight and to feed. When we'd been there about six months, covered in mud, wet through practically all day, absolutely chewed up my lice, we used to say, and to think we wanted to come to this hole. <laughs> I said, yes, we didn't know. Every so often, one side or the other seized a few hundred yards of territory, only to be forced back again surrendering what had cost hundreds of lives to win. The front never moved more than a mile or two in either direction.
the idea of a last great war and being part of it was very, very strong, strong appeal. And it certainly influenced me a great deal. I said, if we're never going to see another war, this is the time to see it. In the summer of 1917, American troops landed in France, returning the favor of Lafayette, the French soldier who had fought with America during the Revolutionary War. One of the officers, he said it loud enough for everybody to hear. Lafayette, he was waving his hand. Lafayette, Lafayette, I didn't know who Lafayette was. Lafayette, Lafayette, we are here. <laughs> We was coming to the end of our men, and when the Americans decided to have a go, uh, I, I was absolutely, I could have said all right. They were untouched by the anxiety and um, doubt that had afflicted everybody else by that stage. They were, they were American, you know, they were, Amer they were what Americans were supposed to be. They were enthusiastic. They were also badly armed, poorly trained, and like the Europeans before them, completely unprepared for what lay ahead of them. The train came through from the front. And we got the go aboard, of course, which we did as soon as we could get on it and ask the guys how it was up there, what's going on, and what do you do, and, and it was a hospital train. I can see these poor kids, like me, youngsters, with a leg gone, or two arms gone, Well, this was a, a kind of a cold water treatment all of a sudden to, to realize what war was like. You grew up very quickly in uh, surroundings like that. It was no longer freshman studies. It was uh, the real world. By 1918, with thousands of Americans pouring into France every day, the Germans decided they had to do something massive. In March 1918, the German army tried its last major gamble, last major offensive on the Western Front, and it was successful. It was a remarkable moment. The Western Front moved. The War of Movement finally arrived. And after years of impasse, the Germans suddenly threatened to overwhelm the Allies and actually capture the French capital, Paris. The Germans had a fire. They called it sweeping fire. Everything up on earth got hit. Uh, they either was wounded or died. The threat to Paris was so severe that a million people simply left the city. The Germans got to within 30 miles. At this point, these still semi-trained American divisions were thrown into the bath, and along with the French, managed to stop the German drive. The Germans had put everything into this last desperate effort, and when it was over, they were finally spent. Along the Western Front that autumn, the focus shifted from war to peace. <laughs> 